that we need to understand in relationship to the body of Christ. Because we know that we, if we're born again, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, the Bible calls us part of His body. We're part of the body of Christ. But we know that all people of all ages that have accepted Christ aren't sitting in our assembly here this morning. Uh, in fact, only just a very, very few of the born-again believers that, that are part of the great body of Christ, the church as we might think of it in a broader context, are here. But yet we represent a local body of believers, a local church, and, uh, and there's many, many things that, that we are to do and function in a certain way uh, as, as it's outlined in the Bible. And so I want us to look this morning at Hebrews chapter 10, again, just a Three simple thoughts this morning about who we are as a church and, and, um, and some encouragement that we can get out of this. Let's look at verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, we'll read down through verse 25. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he, that, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I'm going to just spend a few thoughts from these. There's a lot to say in this passage, but we're just going to three simple thoughts this morning about how we function as the church of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll look to this. Lord, we thank you for again for those that have come to you this morning in baptism and those that we yet anticipate to come to, to be a, join as members of this church. And we thank you that you've established the local church here in Warriors Mark in the way that you have that we are a body of believers that are to care for and fellowship with one another and to uphold your truth in the community that we live in. We pray that you'd help us to be faithful to that. And in these few minutes, help us to be encouraged by what your word has to say uh, in these regards. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I just have three thoughts this morning regarding what the church is and what it does. You know, a lot of people have some false ideas of what the local church is all about. You say, well, I need to be part of a local church because, you know, God's saving the church, right? Well, no, that's not right. Um, we don't become members and we're not baptized, as we said earlier, because we want God to accept us because we think that's going to bring us more favor with Him. The Bible says we get all of the grace from God that we need just when we accept Him in simple faith, when we're born again. And, uh, and so that's the first thing when we think about who the church is. It's not a group of people who are all going to, the, to heaven. I don't, I don't know that every member we have here is born again. We try to say that they are. We, we hope that they are. But people have that in their hearts, right? We have to know. Uh, in, our, in our own hearts, that we are assured of that salvation. And that's the first thought that, that's brought out here in Hebrews chapter 10 that I want us to think about. As a body of believers in a local church, one thing that we should all be assured of is not resting in our membership, not resting in our baptism, not met, resting in our good works, but being assured of our faith, of our destiny. Being assured that we have a home in heaven. As a local church, as a local body of believers, that's the first most vital thing that we can know. And how do we know that we are sure of these things? Well, verse 16 starts with this. He says, This is the covenant that I make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. We can be assured because God's, if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, it's a covenant that God has made with us. It's an agreement. It's a testimony. It's a, it's a, it's a binding offer that, that, that God gives to us through Jesus Christ. He says, come to me and, and you can know that you're saved. It can be an assurance because it's a covenant be, because between God and us. 
It's a, it's a truth that we can have. And it's no longer just about like it was in the Old Testament where there were rules and laws that we follow. No, God says, no, I'm going to actually write those laws into your heart. You're going to have the indwelling Holy Spirit that's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. You can have assurance because I have a covenant and I have the Holy Spirit. That's why Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. God wants us to be assured that we are part of his family. He wants us to know when we accept Christ, that's why, that, that, that we are part of his family, that we are his children. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. But then we also see, not just a, it's a covenant that we can be assured of, but we see in verse 19 why we, another reason why we can have assurance. It says, there, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can have boldness to enter before God himself now, we can have that assurance, we can have that, that, you know, presumption to stand before God, not because of what we've done, but it says by the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ shed his blood for our sins, and it's because of his blood that we now don't have to stand before God as timid, afraid, fearful, worried, you know, not, not sure, you know, not, not, not really 100%. No, the Bible says we should be able to come before God, the holiest of all, with boldness. We should be able to come to him knowing, hey, there's no question in my mind that the blood of Jesus was enough to cover my sins. And that I don't have to be worried when I stand in God's presence anymore as to whether he's going to accept me or not. Because when we accept Christ by faith, it says the blood of Jesus washes us of all sins. And we can accept that and we can be assured of the fact that we now have boldness to enter before God. That's why Hebrews 4, we won't turn to it. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we have that assurance and we know Christ is our Savior, we can come boldly before him and know when we need mercy, God can give it to us. When, when we need help in times of need, and we probably more than once have had times of need, we can come to God with boldness and know he hears us, he cares about us because we're one of his children. We can have that assurance. So we have a covenant. We have the blood of Jesus that gives us that assurance. In verse 22, it says, um, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The Bible says it wants us to have a true heart a genuine, a real, a sincere heart. You know, we only can have assurance of our faith when our faith is truly not just lip service, but it's down in our heart. It's true. It's sincere. It's genuine. It's genuinely who we believe. We believe in Christ and that we know that it's not just, I'm not just saying it to be, you know, Christian. I'm not just saying it to, to sound right or sound righteous. No, I, it's something that I truly believe down in the deep depths of my heart that Jesus Christ died for my sins. We have, because of that true heart, if we have that true heart within us, we can have a full assurance of our faith, full assurance that our faith isn't vain. It's not just lip service. No, because our heart is in it. A true heart produces a true faith and a faith that brings us that assurance. And, um, and then in verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. So we have finally another reason why we can be assured, and that is that um, we can have faith without wavering because God is faithful to us. Not because we're faithful to him, but because he is faithful to us. That's why Paul writes to 2 Timothy, he says this, I know whom I have believed and have persuaded that I can keep my faith. No. He says, I know who I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able. This is God to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, we put our faith out there and it's not, do I have enough faith to get to heaven? No, it's do I have faith in Jesus Christ? Do I have my complete heart and my complete trust and my genuine, sincere in my faith? If that's true, then, then God says, okay, I take that faith and I'm faithful to you because I promised you that no one shall pluck you from my hand. I will be faithful to you. That's why we have that assurance of our faith. We don't have to waver. We don't have to worry if we have faith in Jesus Christ. But secondly, just another thought about the church. We are a group of assured believers. But secondly, we are a group of accountable believers. 
We see this in verse 24. We're accountable. We're accountable, it says, to let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We're accountable to each other and we're accountable to God for two things. Uh, the idea here behind this verse is to provoke unto love. Normally you think I'm provoking me for anger, right? Well, this is provoking you for love. What's it doing? It's prodding you. It's stirring you up. Some translations say stimulate. We're trying to, to work in each other's lives and hearts to, to produce love with each other and to produce good works from the church. Now that's not our whole uh, our whole. Thing that we're about, but it is certainly a key responsibility that we have. We have a responsibility and we are accountable to God for how we react to this command. Are we provoking, stimulating each other to love each other the way we should and to, to produce good works from our lives and through this church that, that honor and, and, and magnify the Lord? John, there's lots of verses that talk about this. We talk about how do we encourage each other to have a Christ-like and loving attitude. All through the New Testament, we see this time and time again. John 13 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. John 15, 17 says, These things I command you, that ye love one another. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. 1 John 3, 11 says, This is the message ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 4.12 says, If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, that's not even all. <laughs> we can continue. There's lots of verses that talk about the importance of loving one another in the church. And you know, so many churches are fallen by the wayside because we don't show love. We, 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 we show division, don't we? We show gossip. We show hypocrisy. We show things that are ugly, <laughs> worldly, things that just say, well, I'm just like everybody else. And that's why oftentimes the world doesn't want anything to do with the Christ that we know because they don't see a difference. But, you know, they should, as the old song says, know we are Christians by our love. We should show our love to each other and to those around us. And that reflects Christ's love to them and to each other. But it also says we're also to act, be active about promoting and encouraging each other to do good works. How do we do good works? Well, it's, here's just a couple of verses about that. Matthew 5 says, Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Good works are are an important part of who we are because we know even from James, we see our works, they see our faith through our works. People see who we are in Christ by how we conduct ourselves, whether we are, are, are full of good works or not. It says in 2 Timothy, all scripture, we know this one, all scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. A lot of times we just stop at that verse. But you know what the next verse says? Why did God give us his word for these things, for these instructions, for this prophet? He says that the man of God may be perfect, that's complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He wants us to be active at doing good works and things around us. It's an dis open display of our faith in Jesus Christ. We're accountable to each other to help stir that up amongst us, to stir up the love, to stir up the good works. We should, be, we should be doing what we can in those areas. And the third thing, again, I said it wouldn't be long. The third thing is we need to be available. We need to be available. We see this in verse 25. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, there was a problem even in the days of the early church with people who decided that church wasn't that important. <laughs> it wasn't, it's not new to our day and age. It was clear back in the first century when you think, man, these believers were on fire. No, there were some that said, you know what? Church isn't that important. We don't really need to get together. I can have my faith on my own. I can go to the golf course and, uh, and pray to the Lord and read my Bible on my own, and I don't really need the church. But here the author of Hebrews says, no, the manner of some is to do that, but we have to be careful. We need to be available. 
as, a, as an assembly, as a fellowship of believers. So we don't forsake, we don't, we don't put aside the assembling of ourselves together. And some people are doing that, but we can't allow ourselves that, uh, that excuse. We need to be available to the church that we're a part of. We need to be a part of it. Be assembling when the doors are open, when we have our services. What can we do to be a part, to be an encouragement, to be active? How can we expect to provoke each other to love and good works if we're not here? <laughs> we have to be with each other, right? We need that time of fellowship. We need that time of interaction. And that's who we are to be as a church, to be available to each other. And that's why it says we're to exhort. And that idea behind exhorting is to encourage. How do we encourage one another? What can we do in church together to encourage someone else? Maybe even encourage them to be in church. Maybe they just, someone needs a call. Someone needs an invitation. Maybe someone needs a ride. I'm certainly glad for those that bring those to church that need rides to be able to get to church. How, how can you encourage someone to be faithful to this commandment, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And then I think here's the telling sign of it all. It says, as you see the day approaching. It says, we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And here's why. Because we know that the days are short. Every day that we live, it's a day closer to Christ's return. I'm not here to tell you when that is. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, I know it's closer today than it was yesterday. And I know it's closer tomorrow than it will be today. So we know that as the days continue to get shorter, that we have less and less and less time to be about our business as a church. And we know that over that time, people are going to be less and less interested in church. We see this through Scripture. 2 Timothy 3 says this, This know in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. They're, they're going to be serving their own needs. They're going to be having their own interests at heart. They're not going to be worried about the interests of the church or the people around them. It's going to be all about what can I do to feed myself? How can I covet? How can I do even, you know, regards to um, loving my own self? How can I boast about my own self? Pride, it says, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. They're not even going to regard their own... Um, Parental authority. They're not going to be thankful for things. They're going to be unholy. He says these are all going to be uh, identifying characteristics of people in the last times. You say, of course, well, we don't know anyone like that today. Well, <laughs> we probably do. <laughs> that sets coming. It's coming. In verse 2 Peter 3, it says, There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You know, I think another reason we, we don't make ourselves a part of a vital church that we should be a part of is because we're just in a rut. We get lulled to sleep in our Christian walk. We say, the Lord's not coming back. Well, maybe he is. I believe that somewhere along the line. But I have no sense of urgency. I have no sense that we have to be about God's work today. Because you know what? It's been 2,000 years of people telling me, you got to be about God's work today. And he hasn't come back yet. That's what the problem was even in that, the, the day that this was written. People became just lulled to sleep. They got in a rut. And they said, hey, where's the promise of his coming? He, he's coming, but yeah, I don't know when. I've got plenty of time. There's always next week to go to church. <laughs> you know, we don't have to worry about that. But Luke 17 tells us a telling tale of what the last days will be like as well. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We don't know what day or hour the Lord's coming back. All we know is he's given us a job to do until that happens. We've got to be careful that we don't just say, I'm going to go about life. I'm going to just go about doing the things that make me happy. I'm going to go about the way things were in the days of Noah and find ourselves, oh, the Lord came. What did I do with my life? What did I do for Christ? We have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to get into that rut. We need to be assured as a body of believers. We need to be accountable to each other as a body of believers. 
And we need to be available to each other as a body of believers in the local church. And those are just three simple thoughts from Hebrews chapter 10 that I hope might encourage you this morning. Realize why our purpose is here. Why do we meet? Why do we come together? The Bible wants us and he, to, to, to encourage each other, to provoke each other to good works, to love. And it wants us to be a light for him, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. It wants us to go about his work in his way. And we can do that together as a fellowship, as a local church that's empowered by him because we know his promises are true and he is always faithful to us. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, as we think about who we are as a local church, we think, well, we're so weak and we have so little to offer. But yet, Lord, some of the best examples of men and women who were used by you are those who were just completely emptied of themselves. We want to be vessels for your use. We want to be clean vessels. We want to be filled with your spirit. We want this church to be used of you to share the gospel, to teach your truth. We want us as a body of believers to have a fellowship here and an accountability with each other to exemplify what true love is and to share each other in each other as we, as we um, do good works and as we share your truth. We pray that you'd help us to be faithful to this calling in our own lives and with those that have come to membership today and those that have um, expressed um, this desire with baptism today to walk in a newness of life. I pray that you'd encourage us and help us to be accountable to each other for this new life that we have in Christ and help us to do it in love and help us to be faithful in it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.